Welcome to Defend the Faith Live. Defend the Faith Live is a Perusia podcast series where we join Dr. Robert Haddad to take a look at a chapter a month of Defend the Faith, Dr. Haddad's excellent book on Catholic apologetics, with host Matthew Herman Tague. In this episode, we cover the divinity of Jesus Christ. Defend the Faith Live is recorded online with a live audience in Perusia World. To be part of the live online audience during these recordings and to interact in the live member-only Q&A sessions that follow, please join us in Perusia World by visiting perusiamedia.com and clicking on Perusia World for all the information on how to join. Perusia Podcast is produced in partnership with EWTN Asia Pacific and Voice of Charity Radio Australia. Dr. Robert Haddad, welcome back to Perusia World. How are you this evening? Oh, good. Thank you, Matthew. I'm glad to be back. I'm very excited about this series and today's episode on the divinity of Christ. So thank you again for having me. Oh, it's it's absolutely my pleasure. I've been quite excited about doing this myself. You know, of course, this is Defend the Faith Live and it's episode two. So we're still just getting started and we're diving straight into the divinity of Christ, which is a, a very exciting subject. So we thank you so much for your time. Mm, most welcome, most welcome. Well, I thought we'd uh, get started tonight with a uh, quick quote from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. So all the live participants who are following along, get your catechisms out, but I'm sure you have uh, handy, at paragraph 464. The unique and altogether singular event of the incarnation of the Son of God does not mean that Jesus Christ is part God and part man nor does it imply that he is the result of a confused mixture of the divine and the human. He became truly man while remaining truly God. Jesus Christ is true God and true man. During the first centuries, the church had to defend and clarify this truth of faith against the heresies that falsified it. So, We're going to be talking about the heresies that claimed that Christ was not true God and true man. So when was it exactly in church history, Robert, that uh, someone claimed that Jesus Christ was not truly divine? Was it fairly early on? Yeah, there were definitely early heresies in the first century AD, and St. John and his gospel responded to them, and they were basically Gnostic heresies, Ebionites, Serinthus. They taught that um, Jesus was just, uh, a creature that he was conceived naturally by St. Joseph and he wasn't a divine being. Um, mm. When it comes to the formal defense of the divinity of Christ by the church at a dogmatic level, conciliar level, the Nicene, Constantinople creeds, etc., that mm. they were the consequence of a emerging crisis and heresies from about the mid third century AD onwards. And the first person I like to mention is Lucian of Antioch. And he was around the year 260 thereabouts and plus or minus. And he was teaching the inferiority and the subordination of the son to the father. Eventually that seat down from Antioch, which is on the Mediterranean coast, in Syria and went down to Egypt. And so you had a priest in Egypt by the early fourth century named Arius of Alexandria. And Arius was very pious and had a great following, particularly by women who were devoted to his asceticism, his spirituality, etc. And he was teaching that um, when you talk about father, son, you, he, he applied a human analogy in the sense that fathers always precede the son. Um, and so when if God is the father, he must have always existed from eternity and preceding any existence of the son. So he coined this phrase, there was a time when the son was not. So according to Arius, the father is not an eternal father. 
because he doesn't have an eternal son. He becomes father after he begets, and in his understanding of begetting, that is, creates a son. So father before son, father creates son. And so for Arius, Christ was uh, certainly not the same substance as the father in his person. He was like in substance. He wasn't God, and he wasn't simply man. He was some type of semi-divinized being in between God and humanity. And this was the beginning of what is known in history as the Arian heresy. Uh, and it was firstly opposed by St. Alexander of Alexandria, the bishop of that city in, in northern Egypt. And he was succeeded by the great St. Athanasius of Alexandria. And he led the battle against Arianism. He defended the ancient Catholic teaching uh, of the divinity of Jesus Christ. And that climaxed in the great victory at the Council of Nicaea in May of the year 325 AD. But even though the Arians were defeated in that council, resoundingly, 316 fathers to two, um, and we had the Nicene Creed emerge from that. And the Nicene Creed was a development, an augmentation of the Apostles' Creed. So we, when it came to Jesus Christ, we have these words added, uh, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. But the, despite that um, resounding victory for orthodoxy, um, the Arians persisted. And despite the fact that Arius himself died in AD 336, a new champion, so to speak, for Arianism was Eusebius, Bishop Eusebius of Nicomedia, that is a city in Northwest Asia Minor. And he engaged in a long but slow and successful comeback for the Arians, firstly manipulating Constantine's sister, then Constantine himself, putting doubts in his mind about uh, St. Athanasius, uh, portraying St. Athanasius as hardline, as extreme, as uncompromising, as refusing to uh, bring peace to the church and to the empire, etc. And so Eusebius was the architect of a strategy of deposing Orthodox bishops wherever possible, particularly in, firstly in the Middle East, you know, uh, and then eventually uh, replacing them with Arian bishops and then get, getting a majority of bishops who were Arian and then uh, gathering again together in council to reformulate the Nicene Creed and to substitute the word consubstantial, which is in Greek as homoousius, with another, another word, homoousius. Uh, the difference is only one letter in Greek the letter iota, which is equivalent to the letter I. When you look at the two words, homoousius, one in substance or consubstantial, and homois, ho, homoousius, they look virtually identical. But homoousius was the word, as a word meant like in substance. And so you get robber councils being held in the, in the period after AD 325, in the AD 350s, etc. Uh, the Council of Seleucia, for example, where bishops intimidated by imperial authority would formulate new creeds, compromise creeds, uh, mm. which were vague enough to admit the Arian heresy and perhaps still orthodox enough for Catholics to say uh, in an orthodox sense. But this was eventually defeated. It took decades, but by the late by around 380, 381 AD, um, the Catholic belief, the Orthodox belief in the divinity of Christ triumphed for a second time at, con at conciliar level, and that is the First Council of Constantinople in AD 381, where the creed was of Nicaea was reaffirmed and added to again um, with the insertion of words in defense of the divinity of uh, the Holy Spirit, because Post AD 325, there were various strains of Arianism and unorthodoxy. Um, there were Catholics 
who believed in the divinity of Christ, pure and simple. There are Arians who denied it. There were semi-Arians somewhere in between. And then you get the Macedonian heresy of Bishop Macedonius, who denied the divinity of the Holy Spirit. So there's a logical flow. If, if you deny the divinity of Christ, you're going to deny the belief in the Blessed Trinity. You're going to deny the belief in the divinity of, of the Holy Spirit. So the Council of Constantinople added the following words with respect to the Holy Spirit. Originally, it would say in the Apostles' Creed, I believe in the Holy Spirit. But then Constantinople added the following uh, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. So you had a clear statement uh, defending the divinity of the Holy Spirit. Now, Arianism would linger on for centuries. It would be adopted by the Visigoths uh, uh, through missionaries, Arian missionaries, so to speak, who crossed over the Danube River, converted the Visigoths to an Arian form of Christianity, who eventually then went and settled in Spain in the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, but um, yes, it was a long and hard road. And eventually, uh, through great saints, particularly St. Athanasius, again, who was actually exiled five times from his see. And but wow. died um, after 50 years of combating Arian heresy. He died in peace and as Bishop of Alexandria. So that's in a nutshell sums up a very long, complex history of those early heresies denying the divinity of Christ, denying the Trinity, denying the divinity of the Holy Spirit. That's awesome. And, and you mentioned the, the different words, homoousios and homoousios, and that there is uh, only one iota of difference. And of course, that's where we get that expression, isn't it? Not mm -hmm. one iota of difference. All right. That's so it's, right. it's a Catholic expression. It's incredible how one Greek letter mm. not only changes um, the faith substantially, mm. but actually changes world history. Mm. If we had fall into the Arian heresy, if we had admitted that iota into the word homoousios, our faith would be completely different. And what would be the Catholic resistance to another heresy that would rise up in later centuries that uh, believed in one God, uh, believed in Jesus Christ as a prophet, but denied his divinity, namely Islam. Mm. So we can see, you know, only God knows and only we will realize when we get to heaven, hopefully, the significance of the heroism, the staunch resistance of uh, St. Athana Athanasius, even mm. though he, and this is important because today, sta staunch Catholics, Orthodox Catholics often get labeled, you know, mm. as uncompromising, as fundamentalist as rigid, whatever, whatever. And all we're doing really is adhering to the faith, the apostolic faith, the, the, the scriptures, uh, the apostolic tradition, etc. And we need to have a similar courage uh, to what St. Athanasius had in his time. And St. Athanasius was persecuted, not just within his church, but by the imperial authorities. There's a funny story. Uh, another emperor named Valens, um, was wanting to persecute St. Athanasius. And one day, St. Athanasius was fleeing down the Nile River. And he was in a rowboat, and there were, you know, a couple of men rowing away steadily uh, to escape the imperial soldiers who were out to arrest him. And St. Athanasius could see that the soldiers were catching up in their boat. And he then directed his own men, look, turn the boat around and row towards the, the, the the soldiers and he he they did that and when the two boats intersected uh the soldiers in the other boat shouted out have you seen athanasius and saint athanasius responded by saying yes a few moments ago he was heading in that direction the opposite direction so the soldiers <laughs> kept going in the other direction and saint athanasius escaped but mm. it was it was i recommend strongly that we read good histories about this period um, just to strengthen our own faith and to get an appreciation of the creeds that we say in Mass. We just take them for granted. We might go to Mass and, you know, we're there under obligation. We're happy to be there. We say the creed. We say it in a very perfunctory manner. But that, that creed that of, of Nicaea and Constantinople, that was uh, the final 
result of a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. Um, and all up, the Trinitarian and Christological, Christological controversies of the early church span from AD 325 right through to AD 680. It was a long period, over 350 years before the church finally settled all the questions relating to the Trinity, uh, the divinity of Christ, how many persons in Christ, how many natures in Christ, uh, whether Christ had a human will, human intellect, et cetera, et cetera. So, mm. yes, it's a very interesting period. It certainly is indeed. And uh, I've, I've also heard the expression uh, Athanasius contra mundi, mm. Athanasius versus the world, which yes, really yes. gets at just how persecuted he was. Yes, and it's a frightening thought, really. Athanasius against the world, uh, because it was at one point you could count the number of Orthodox bishops who held firmly to the divinity of Christ in, in less than 10 fingers. Mm. Okay, because most bishops were had either defected to Arianism or were intimidated by imperial authority to submit to that particular heresy, or at least to remain silent. So we can name, I can name other great bishops who held out at this time. There was St. Eustatius. Mm -hmm. uh, there was, um, ironically, and this is almost humorous, St. Lucifer of Gagliari from Sardinia. There was the great St. Hilary of Poitiers. Mm -hmm. There was the uh, St. Basil the Great, St. Gregory mm -hmm. Nazianzus, St. Gregory Nisa. There was a handful of others. Um, of course, St. Jerome and St. Augustine later on in the late 4th century and early 5th century will reflect on that period. It was St. Jerome who, who gave us this famous phrase that we went to sleep we went to sleep, and we woke up and we found the world Aryan. So it had become Aryan almost, in a sense, overnight. Mm -hmm. um, in the same way the church is going through a crisis of faith today, uh, mm -hmm. You know, you go back to the 50s and 60s, early 60s, when we had 50 to 60 percent mass attendance rates in Australia and half a you know, century later was struggling to get 10 percent to go. And regular mass attendance in Australia, according to official surveys, is going once a month. Yeah. And you just wonder, you know, um, we woke up and we found the church is empty. Mm. Uh, and, but this, is, this needs to not make us fall into despair. We look at a great St. Athanasius, Athanasius Contra Mundum, and we have to say, we have to be the new Athanasius of today, mm. uh, you know, and be against the spirit of the world today because we've got much bigger issues to deal with. Of course, the, the divinity of Christ is a gigantic issue, but okay. we've got so many other issues as well. Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite stories about St. Athanasius, and I don't know if it's, uh, if it's apocryphal or not, is that apparently at one point the debate got so heated that Athanasius either punched or slapped Arius. No, this was St. Nicholas, wasn't it? Yes, yes, the famous was a, Santa Claus bishop. That, that's right. He's the origin of, of Santa Claus, and Nicholas got, uh, got so angry he actually slapped or punched Athanasius, I, I, for which, I, I, for I which I'm always... I, I, I always joke that um, that you should never get between Santa Claus and the divinity of Christ because there's yeah. worse than coal you can get for Christmas. Yeah. Well, from my re uh, recollection, St. Nicholas of Myra, as he was, and Myra is in southern Turkey on the Mediterranean coast, he actually was a staunch defender of the divinity of Christ. And mm. he punched another bishop, but that was apparently an Arian bishop. I so see. he got a little hot under the collar, old style <laughs> apologetics, uh, and um, certainly more intent on winning arguments than winning, you know, friends. Um, yeah, but the, it just goes to show how uh, heated and how passionate people were for the faith. And we need to have that same passion, uh, not to be punching out people by any means, of course not physically or verbally, but have the passion to stand up for truth. Mm, amen. So we'll, we'll call that an old apologetics technique, certainly yeah. not one would we, we would be teaching to this day. Um, no. Yeah, it is a fascinating period of history. And, and likewise, I suggest people do a lot of reading. 
uh, on this subject. Uh, you've mentioned right at the beginning, though, Robert, that this heresy actually has its origins in Gnosticism. So what exactly is the heresy of Gnosticism? Well, Gnosticism, um, well, there are various forms of it. And to put it simply, Gnosticism, well, gnos Gnosis in Greek means knowledge. So an agnostic is someone who doesn't have knowledge of whether God exists or not. But Gnosticism uh, tends to be rather esoteric in the sense that, oh, we're saved by having a secret knowledge. Those who have the secret knowledge are... Uh, are the ones on the road of salvation rather than uh, salvation through faith hope and love but salvation through having a secret knowledge and this um this was part of a system of uh dualism to put it simply dualism means that there exists in the universe two gods two equally powerful gods but two competing gods uh, the God, the good God who created the spiritual realm, the spiritual universe, everything spiritual, and the evil God or the evil principle who created the um, material world. And bodies, human bodies, are part of the material world. And human bodies are therefore evil. And though we have a spiritual component, so the quest of the Gnostic is to free our spirit from the prisons of, the, of our bodies. Now, how does this affect or relate to the divinity of Christ? Well, if, if the divine is good, if God is good, he wouldn't unite with something sinful, that is human uh, matter, human flesh, human bodies. So really, one cannot believe if Jesus Christ uh, is good um, and he's God, then he wouldn't have a body. But since he had a body, he couldn't have been good. He couldn't, I mean, it's the body itself is not good, and he couldn't have been God who voluntarily takes on a human body. Um, so this was the heresy that John, St. John, combated. And you don't just know that when you understand the purpose of his gospel, but we also know it by clues embedded in John's three epistles, smaller epistles, because in one of those epistles, John goes out of his way to stress how he was a witness, how he heard Christ, how he saw Christ, how he touched Christ. And when you read that, you think, oh, that's nice and cute. Of course, John was an, a disciple. He becomes an apostle. That's why we listen to John, because he's, he's, he's authoritative, because he, he knew Christ personally and saw him and touched him. But what John is also telling us is that, hey, trust me, not the Gnostics, they don't have any secret knowledge that's true. They have only falsity. They weren't there. They didn't see Christ. They didn't hear Christ. They didn't touch him. The true knowledge is from the apostolic tradition, me as an apostle passing on what I saw, what I heard, what I touched. And that is Jesus Christ in the flesh. That's why John would say in his epistles, both first and second epistle, he speaks about the Antichrist is the one who denies that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Mm. Okay, because he's opposing Gnosticism, which said that another form was actually Docetism or Dechetism. And Docetism was combated by a disciple of St. John, named St. Ignatius of Antioch. And these people believe that. Docate believed that Jesus Christ only had the appearance of a body, a phantom. He didn't have a true human body, human flesh, human bones, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He only looked like he had a body. And, and Ignatius con combated this, and particularly in his letter to the Smenaeans, written around AD 110, where he attacks the Docate because they refused to participate in the Christian liturgy, the Agape meal, what we call the Mass. Okay, the holy sacrifice of the mass in our language today. The Docate wouldn't come to the Christian gatherings and receive the Eucharist. Why? Because they did not believe that the Eucharist really became the body and blood of Christ. Why? Because they did not believe Jesus Christ had a real body and blood, only the appearance thereof. So we can see denials of the divinity of Christ. They're clearly in the first century 
attacked in the writings of St. John the Apostle, attacked in the writings of St. Ignatius of Antioch, and later on, attacked very vigorously by St. Irenaeus of Lyon and his great work against heresies. And our knowledge of Gnosticism for the, you know, for the 19th centuries was derived primarily from the works of St. Um, Irenaeus of Lyon. But later on in the mid 20th century in 1945, to, pre to be precise, they found in a place in Egypt, the Naj Hammadi manuscripts at a place called Naj Hammadi, they found in a big um, clay pot, um, Gnostics writings, uh, which had been buried in, in around the middle of the middle of the fourth century um, in response to a persecution of Gnosticism by against an Athanasius of, of Alexandria. He, you know, prescribed uh, Gnosticism and in response, some of these Gnostic heretics, rather than destroying their writings, buried them in this jar, and we find them again in 1945. And they prove that St. Irenaeus's um, understanding and his portrayal of Gnosticism in his writings was, is substantially correct and honest. Wonderful. And it's amazing, too, to think that even in the time that John's writing his epistles and gospels, he's already dealing with heresies. So the mm. church has already had to deal with false beliefs right from the very beginning, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, we've never been without heresy and we will never be without heresy. And if you want to be a heresy fighter today, you'll certainly be very busy. <laughs> I saw you. And yeah. as I understand it, the word heresy means to choose for oneself. Is that correct? That's right. It's it yeah. being very eclectic. It's heresis, I think, is the Greek word. And it's mm. someone who just uh, decides to pick and choose what we call cafeteria Catholicism. A heretic is not someone totally devoid of truth. They mm. have truth, but they have error. And so that's, that's probably more dangerous than someone who's an outright apostate. And now, mm -hmm. An apostate is someone who's abandoned the faith completely. Mm -hmm. All right? The Catholic faith, Christianity completely. A heretic can get, can gain more traction with people because, you know, there's, there's elements of truth there that seduce mm -hmm. people. And, and then they, they, the heretics earn the trust of people as a consequence, and then they infuse their heresies there mixed with the truth, and that's how people swallow it. Yeah, I believe it was uh, Pope Leo XIII who said something along the lines of uh, the worst kind of heretic is the one who teaches mostly truth but adds a drop of heresy, like adding a drop of poison to a cup mm. of water. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's... absolutely correct. Mm. And uh I believe this, the, the, this, these Gnostic heresies are also one of the reasons why, why John really um, concentrates so heavily on the body and on the sacraments as well, because I believe one of the implications, if, if you believe that the, the body is bad and that to make more bodies is to trap more spiritual souls in these bad bodies, then you would shun marriage, you would shun mm. procreation which is one of the reasons John then really emphasises the wedding at Cana, yeah? Oh, yes, that, that's yeah. understandable. Uh, and it's correct. Um, the Gnostics um, had their own sacramental system, so to speak, mm -hmm. and they certainly considered marriage to be evil for this reason, as you stated. They would actually have a sacrament of suicide. Wow. It was called the consolatum, where basically, yeah, you go through a ritual uh, a religious ritual whereby you leave this world um, mm. and you, you liberate your spirit from the prison of the evil body. And um, yes, it's, it's, I actually, to my great shock, encountered an ex-student of mine having taught us in Charles for 15 years. And there was a student who left at year 10 went to another Catholic school for year 11 and 12. And this is in the mid nineties. And I encountered him again, seven or eight years later. And he told me that he'd become a Gnostic. Wow. I was aghast. So it still exists. Gnosticism in perhaps not exactly the same form as it was in the early centuries, but there's still people today who claim that they're Gnostics. 
Wow, it's still hanging around. So mm. you mentioned that uh, we'd pretty much um, had uh, the heresy of, of Arianism clearly defined by about the 600s. Was that it done and dusted? Um, look, Arianism, well, in various forms persisted. And I remember once uh, meeting a local politician, a member of the New South Wales State Parliament, we were, group of us were together with him and we made a statement about socialism. And he said, oh, that's like trying to fight the Aryan heresy. Like that's <laughs> dead and buried. And I just thought to myself, hold on. No, no, no. There are many Protestant denominations, if you can call them Protestant, maybe most mainstream Protestants wouldn't call them Protestant, but there are many sectarian groups today enough mm -hmm. that are still denying the divinity of Christ. We've got the Worldwide Church of God, um, uh, founded by um, Herbert W. Armstrong in the United States. We have the Christadelphians, a breakaway group from the Baptists in the 19th century in the United States. We have the famous, of course, the Jehovah Witnesses mm -hmm. who deny the Trinity and the divinity of Christ. Though we can't say, even though the Jehovah Witnesses claim that Arius was an example of a Jehovah Witness, one Jehovah Witness that has existed in every age of, you know, the last 2,000 years. The Arians, it's, it's dishonest for any Jehovah's Witness to claim that Arius was originally a Jehovah's Witness because Arius did believe that Jesus was, okay, semi-divine, semi-human, you know, um, but he didn't believe what Jehovah's Witnesses believe about Jesus, namely that he's the Archangel Michael in human form. And Jehovah's Witnesses don't tell you that first start. Uh, they'll come knocking on your door and they'll certainly deny the divinity, I'm sorry, the Trinity and the divinity of Christ. And they'll like to engage in conversation, rigorous or otherwise about that. But they don't come out straight out and say that, you know, Jesus was really uh, the St. Michael in human form. I can't give you the reasons why off the top of my head they do believe that. I have read it, but it slipped my mind. Um, but uh, no, they're certainly on their own when they make that claim, not only in, in the current times, but throughout history. I'm not aware of any uh, heretical group or otherwise that held such a view about Jesus in the, last, in the pr previous 20 centuries. Mm. So it's definitely still around today, but uh, I believe that Arianism even has um, some influence on Islam. I, I heard or read somewhere that um, Muhammad himself may have been influenced by an Aryan monk or priest. Is there any truth to that statement? Um, what I have heard, and I can't say this is, you know, necessarily academic, mm -hmm. but there was a priest named Abul Nofal who had an influence on Muhammad um, before he came out as a prophet of Allah. Uh, the problem in the East, that it was racked by various heresies concerning Christ. Um, you had, of course, Arianism, you had semi-Arianism, and you had um, the monophysite heresy that arose after the Council of... Um, well, you had, firstly, before that, from Nestorianism, which said that Jesus was two persons, not one person, not one divine person, but a divine person and a human person. Then you had monophysitism, um, uh, which den denied that Christ had two natures, okay? He was one person, uh, the divine, a divine person, but he had only one nature, and that nature was an admixture of the human and the divine Etc. So, and then you had, of course, um, monothel monothelitism, mm -hmm. which denied that Jesus Christ had a human will. He only had a di the divine will. So the East was very much divided. Um, and those who know Islam better than I do, and they study the Quran and they study what we know about uh, Muhammad in the Hadith, the writings of. Uh, Sunni Islam, etc. That uh, Muhammad put this new religion together from various sources. Um, you know, animism, paganism in in Arabia, uh, Judaism, Christianity. But what types of Christianity? The various heresies 
that was swirling in that part of the world that it weakened the Byzantine Empire. Um, and when Islam arose as a very militant force, um, literally through the force of arms, conquering Mecca, conquering Medina, Muhammad did, then unifying the whole of the Arabian Peninsula. When it moved northwest towards Jerusalem, um, the Levon, Jerusalem, Lebanon, Syria, then Egypt, etc. It found those countries, relatively speaking, easy pickings, mm. um, and conquered them and imposed a, okay, a mono, monotheism. Yes, one God, um, and Jesus was important in this new religion as the second greatest of all the prophets of Allah, but only a prophet, not a divine person, not true God and true man, just purely true man uh, and the holy prophet, second to Muhammad, as I said. And that view of Jesus could well have been, you know, formed by Muhammad in his own mind, influenced by the swirling heresies in that part of the world in the sixth and seventh century. And I believe we touched on um, the Jehovah's Witness mentioning um, certain uh, texts of uh, John as saying the word was with God and the word was a God. Mm. And that's where, one, where part of their confusion comes from. Explain the, the, the um, apologetics for that. Uh, yes, for well, it's here. about going back to the Greek. Yeah. It's not that simple, but basically where you have the word God, Theo, in mm. Greek, it's normally preceded by the definite article ho. Now, just imagine the word in English, H-O. But in mm -hmm. Greek, it's a, an O with a little comma on the top of it. All right. And when you see that, that's pronounced ho. And it's a definite article, the. So it's the God. So mm -hmm. traditionally, when we see the God, ho theo, we translate it as God. Mm -hmm. Okay. But. It, when you have the word Theo appearing sometimes without uh, a definite article in front of it, and the Greek didn't have an indefinite article like we do, the letter A by itself, all right? So um, when you come across, when you look at John 1.1 1, 1, and you see in the beginning was the word, right, which is ho logos, mm -hmm. uh, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God, um, ho Theo, and the word was God, that last mention of God, we just have Theo. Now, the vast majority of Greek experts over the centuries have translated that last word Theo as just God because it's consistent with the rest of the sentence. In many instances, even the Jehovah Witnesses New World Translation of Scripture, where they translate Theo simply as God, but they see for themselves in this particular text, John 1.1, 1, 1, they insert a uh, the English uh, indefinite article, a, before God, and, and the word was a God. Uh, they just presume to do that uh, in conformity with their preconceived theology, in contrast or against the, the common translation of that same text by all you know, reputable Christians, whatever, over the previous 19 centuries. And what they try to tell us when the text, when they translate the text Theo to mean a God, is that Jesus is a God like the angels. I think we go, I can look here in front of me from Defend the Faith. It's mm -hmm. uh, like the angels are called gods because of their great power. Um, but the, 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 the scriptures don't intend to tell us that they were God in the same way as God the Father. And hence, they apply the same by analogy to Jesus. He is a God because he's powerful, glorious. He is God the mighty, but not God the almighty. Um, and, but he, he, in the end, he's only a creature. So that's basically their position. Yeah. 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 So... That's, uh, that, that's um, the sort of the modern uh, equivalent of this Aryan heresy by the Jehovah's Witness. Um, how exactly do we go about proving the divinity of Christ, though? So how did Athanasius do it? How do we then subsequently go about proving that Jesus was, in fact, was and is divine? 
Well, I, could, I take two paths. One is scripture and one is historical, looking at the church fathers. So St. Athanasius was fighting to have declared what is the Catholic faith? Mm. Was Arianism really authentically representing the ancient Catholic faith or was it a novelty? Mm -hmm. Of course, the Arians were claiming that they were the authentic Catholics because they were trans, uh, they were interpreting scripture correctly when you look at all the verses together. But mm -hmm. um, I can point to many, uh, enough church fathers, well before St. Athanasius, who spoke clearly about the divinity of Christ. Now, I mentioned at the beginning, yes, you had Lucian of Antioch, etc from the mid third century and and others after him but i can quote you now saint ignatius of antioch again letter to the romans ad 110 where he says to the church beloved and enlightened after the love of jesus christ our god and then in the same pa paragraph at the end he says i wish an unalloyed joy in jesus christ our god now this is a man who was a immediate disciple of St. John the Apostle. Mm -hmm. This is no insignificant figure of the church in that age. He was an, a, a bishop of the first city where the followers of Jesus Christ were called Christians. He was the third bishop of Antioch after St. Peter and Evodius. He was ordained and made a bishop by St. Peter, and he had a very close, intimate relationship uh, allegiance, friendship, partnership with St. John the Apostle. Then we've got St. Irenaeus, I could quote here, and he's against heresies written around AD 180, that he is in himself, sorry, that he is himself in his own right, God and Lord, an eternal king, an only begotten and incarnate word. Now, how Catholic is that? That mm. is 150 odd years before the Nicene Creed. So yeah. we can see the Nicene Creed will have terms in it like, you know, only begotten, begotten, etc. Terms like incarnate word, um, you know, uh, importing really these terms from uh, Catholic usage going back a century and a half earlier. Then we have, we have the great Clement of Alexandria, the second great teacher in succession at the School of Alexandria in, in Northern Egypt. In his letter, sorry, in his work, Exhortation to the Greeks, he uh, describes Christ, he alone being both God and man. Okay. Then we have St. Athanasius, of course, letter concerning the decrees of the Council of Nicaea, describes Christ as inseparable from the substance of the Father, except then I, I can put forward many other quotes. So that's the first avenue. Yeah. Okay. The Council of Nicaea did not invent a new doctrine. The Council of Nicaea affirmed uh, what was the apostolic tradition, the apostolic teaching, what the fathers had taught for centuries beforehand. Then we can move on to scripture. Um, uh, if you want to invite me, I can give you a few examples of other scripture quotes besides John 1.1. 1, 1. Yes, please. All right, well. And I should also mention too that we are, as we're doing this, we're both referring to your book, Defend the Faith. That's and right. And so I recommend to all of our listeners that you pick up a copy of this at the Perusia um, shop because uh, this is the book we're referring to. This is the textbook. Oh, look, the, the uh, live participants are all holding up their copies. Aren't they yeah. wonderful? Yes. Yeah, all right. Let's face a practical reality here. One day, Jehovah's Witness is going to knock on your door again, right? And when you're in, if, you want, if you're inclined to invite them in and have a conversation with them about the Trinity, the divinity of Christ, most people are not going to be just speaking off the top of their head. Have this in front of you. It's your manual. And I'll use it right now as a manual. So I've got my Jehovah Witnesses friend next to me I, here. I'll just say to him, look, here's, here's an Old Testament quote, you know, yeah. Isaiah 9, 6, which describes uh, the, the future birth of this great king. Uh, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That's Isaiah 9, 6, Mighty God. Well, Jehovah's Witnesses try and get around that by saying, um, 
you know, El Jabor uh, is, yes, correctly translated as mighty God, but that's not almighty God. Well, hmm. you know, he's still called God. And there are many instances where God is called simply mighty God. Genesis 49, 4, Psalm 51, Psalm 132, verses 2 and 5, Isaiah 10, 21, Jeremiah 32, 18. So, all mm. right. Then I'll, one of my favorites is from John 8, 58. One of my favorites too. Yeah. Yeah. You want to give us the context? If yeah. So John uh, chapter 8, verse 58. Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Yes. Yeah, Jesus had said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And you can imagine the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees hearing this, thinking, what do you mean Abraham rejoiced to see your day? In their minds, now we know you're mad. Because Abraham was the 21st century BC. And here's this young Jesus of Nazareth in his early 30s, claiming that Abraham somehow knew him, met him, saw him, heard him. It's like me saying today, uh, Jesus rejoiced, um, you know, in seeing me. Well, what are you talking about, Robbie? Jesus is 2,000 years ago. Jesus, Abraham was as ancient to Jesus Christ as Jesus Christ is to me, okay, mm -hmm. 20 <laughs> centuries apart. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, and... The, the, his audience responds to Jesus and says, how, ha, how have you seen Abraham? You're not, a, you're not even 50 years of age. And Jesus responds by saying, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Hmm. Now, if Jesus simply wanted to say, hey, look, I'm not an ordinary man, but I'm still just a man, an extraordinary man. Before Abraham existed, I existed. I pre-exist Abraham. Travel witnesses are willing to give it that interpretation. They believe that Jesus is the firstborn of all creation, meaning he's the first be creature being created by God, by Jehovah. And the rest of creation was created by this angelic being, Jesus. Right? So Jesus is the firstborn, he's the first creature, and Jesus creates all the other creatures. So Jesus, according to Jehovah Witnesses, to the Jehovah Witnesses, does precede Abraham. But is that is that what is that all Jesus is trying to tell us here? That he precedes, predates Abraham. He's saying that, but more, because he's because he uh, attributes to himself the divine name. And that's I key am. in that. Yeah, that's that. I am is is key there. If yeah. I precede Abraham, I would mm -hmm. say before Abraham was, I was. Mm. Okay. No, he says before Abraham was, I am. And mm. how did the audience understand Jesus here? Well, they understood him to be claiming identity with the God of Moses because it is to Moses that God reveals his name, I am who am. Mm. All right. And we get the first letters of those four words in Hebrew and we create a new word in acronym. And or in Greek, it's called the tetragrammaton, the four letters. I am who am. Put those four letters, the first letter of those four words together. We get another word in Hebrew, uh, Yahweh. In fact, we don't know how to pronounce it, whether it was Yahweh or Yowo or Ye, We, because we only have the consonants. We don't have the vowels. Uh, in Hebrew, but for the sake of the argument, it's let's say Yahweh. So Jesus was basically saying, "I, Abraham rejoiced to see my day because um, I existed before Abraham, and not only did I exist before Abraham, I had an eternal pre-existence mm. because I am, I mm -hmm. am God, I am the God mm. of Moses." Um, mm. the, the Greek words here, ego. E I my, okay, uh, I am, and the fact is that again, Jehovah Witnesses counter this argument by saying he didn't say I am who am, he just said I am. But we get various instances where the term I am is a, relates to God. Isaiah forty three twenty five forty five eighteen forty eight twelve, and that's mm -hmm. how the Jews understood Jesus. That's why we read in the next sentence 
they took up stones to throw at him. And that's the punishment for blasphemy. What's blasphemy? Attributing to a creature that which properly belongs to God. And Jesus is accused of blasphemy because he's attributing to himself divinity, divine status, which belongs to God only. By the way, before I finish on this verse, I want to debunk this verse debunks another modern heresy that oh, really? was taught in the 70s and 80s and 90s and still some places today that mm-hmm. Jesus yes he was God but while he worked on walked on earth he didn't know he was God ah. Jesus didn't know he was God some people mm-hmm. qu- quote you know the theolo- German theologian Karl Rahner for an explanation on this well I'm I'm beggared uh um you know to know uh, what explanation you can give? Because mm-hmm. if you know these same people would say, yes, Jesus was divine. I know that when Jesus walked the earth, he was divine. Well, if you know, how come Jesus himself doesn't know that he was divine? Mm-hmm. Uh, if if I was divine, I think I'd know it. Okay, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. and this shows Jesus knew it because he gave publicly attributed to himself publicly the divine name. He wouldn't do that yeah. unless he knew yeah. he was gone. Absolutely. Um, and even later on in John, he says, I and the Father are one. Right? Yes. And yeah. that, that's another proof text. That's John yeah. 10, 30. And we've got to be careful here, though, because, of course, it's one in substance, one in being. That's consubstantial. Yeah. Uh, but they are one in substance, but they're not one person. Okay, they are distinct persons. So we get oneness Christianity today, Um, an ancient heresy in the past, another one. We're going to write a book one day called, you know, um, um, History of 100 Heresies, okay, to try and capture all these. But there was another heresy. Compendium of heresy. (laughs) Yeah, Paulus Samosata. Paulus Samosata Mm -hmm. uh, 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 put forward a heresy called modalism. Uh, otherwise known as patripassianism, otherwise known today as oneness Christianity, meaning that there's one God, but he's one person. Um, There is not three distinct persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Father, Son, Holy Spirit are all really just uh, different expressions of the one person. So modalism says that God the Father that's his normal mode, and he can appear in a different mode as the sun and a third mode as the Holy Spirit in the same way that, you know, H2O can appear as ice, water, and steam. Um, and patripassianism tells us that because God is only one person, then the person on the cross suffering is the Father, hence patri, Father, passionism. Father suffering on the cross, not the son suffering on the cross. And right. one this Christianity today, which has at least, there's one version of Pentecostalism, which embraces oneness Christianity and has at least 10 million adherents. Um, that, yes, that um, uh, God is one person, Father, Son, Holy Spirit are just three different names for the one person rather than three distinct persons. If I could just, if you give me the liberty, I'll just give you one more verse, and there are plenty of others, but one more strong verse in favour or that supports the divinity of Christ is we find in John 20, 28. This is the also moment. one of my favourites, yeah. yeah. Who's the apostle involved St. here? Thomas the apostle. And what does he say when he sees the resurrected Christ? So he's, he's doubted and he says, I will not believe until I put my fingers in the holes and my hand in his side. And after he does, he says, my Lord and my God. God, that's correct. And we instinctively looking at that text, we, yep. we picture St. Thomas on his knees looking at Jesus and saying, my Lord and my God. Well, the Jehovah Witnesses would tell us that uh, St. Thomas fell on his knees and said to Jesus, my Lord, and then looked up, my God. So Uh when when Thomas and Thomas said, my God, he wasn't looking at Jesus. He's looking up over Jesus towards heaven. But that's not in the text. That's that's inserting uh, that's one's own theology into the text. Yes. All right. There are many others, but uh, time forbids us to explore them further. But indeed. Indeed. And of course, that that statement, my Lord and my God, we can say at every single mass and earn a partial indulgence. 
So mm. Pope St. Pius X um, issued an indulgence for quietly saying to oneself at the, at the elevation of the Eucharist, my Lord and my God. So yeah, I just wanted to point that out, but you're absolutely right. We could go on and on, but uh, we do want to keep to a, a certain time schedule. And we do have um, a, a whole bunch of uh, participants with us in the live who I'm sure are, are dying to have a, um, a the, the private Q&A with you afterwards, Robert. So we'll leave it there. That was chapter two, uh, episode two of Defend the Faith Live. Dr. Robert Haddad, thank you so much for giving us your time and your knowledge. Thanks very much, Matthew. God bless. That's it from us. Farewell and God bless. Thanks for listening to the Perusia podcast. If you've enjoyed these podcasts, please share with your family and friends. And for more information about everything Perusia, please visit our website at perusiamedia.com.